Hey everybody, it's Allie and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, April 28th, 2013. Adam confronts Chelsea right up at the front of this week's show about whether or not she's pregnant and she is faced with a choice in that moment. She can either tell the truth, tell Adam that yes, she's pregnant and he's the father of her child and she's been keeping the secret from him, or she can lie and say that Dylan, who's sitting right there, is the father and it's totally unbeknownst to him. So you can see the conflict in her face and ultimately, as I think we all kind of knew she was going to do, she chose the lie. She confesses that yes, she's pregnant, but it's Dylan's baby, not yours, Adam. And the information, it was almost like a tornado of information was ripping through Crimson Lights at that moment because it was a triple whammy of information. Yes, I'm pregnant. She's been trying to keep that secret for weeks. Adam, you're not the father. And Dylan, you person I've slept with once, magically, you're the father. It was so, such a, a whirlwind scene. Dylan is just sitting there, stunned. Wow, didn't know you could get someone pregnant by having unprotected sex with a stranger. <laughs> and Adam, I felt horrible for him. He was kind of quickly wiping away tears out of his eyes as he's saying to Chelsea, this is how you mourn our marriage by going out and jumping into bed with the first man that you see and getting pregnant with his child. That's how you mourn our marriage and our lost child. As if Adam really has any room to talk. He did a really great job, a really mature job of mourning the loss of their child and their marriage by getting involved with Sharon and be closing himself off. I mean, Adam is no saint here, but he was very quick to lash out at Chelsea. I mean, understandably, I understand his position too, but Dylan, he immediately kicks into protector mode. Like, Dylan... You saw how he was with a, a barmaid, someone he doesn't know, the mother of his child. He's ready to lash right back out at Adam, ready to start a fight if he needs to. But Adam just says, you know what, Dylan, you got her pregnant. She's your problem now. And it was such a sad, sad scene. I Really, I felt bad for pretty much everybody in this situation. Adam walks out and Chelsea has to get back at him, get the last word in, and she just says, I hope you and Victor are happy together. As if Victor was totally the reason that their marriage didn't work out. I don't think that's entirely true. I think at this point, Chelsea and Adam are both hurting over the loss of everything that they had and the, everything that they wanted and everything they were planning for the future. And they're lashing out at each other, trying to say the meanest things that they can think of to, to hurt one another. And I think that's kind of not that uncommon in relationships. Sometimes the more you hurt, the more you want the other person to hurt. And poor Dylan is caught up in the middle of this. He goes to see Sharon. I was kind of surprised. I guess Sharon's the only neutral party friend for him in Genoa City at this point. He tells her everything. And Sharon, up to this point, knew that Adam knew that Chelsea was pregnant, but didn't know who the father was. So this was news to Sharon that Dylan is the father. She <laughs> wraps up with Dylan real quick and makes a beeline over to Adam's house over at the mansion to see if he's okay. As she opens up the door, kind of takes one look at him, and and they start just kissing <laughs> just intensely like making out like he kisses her and she doesn't resist and they're just making out making out and he's saying I want to feel good right now and you could tell that that's where it is he's so hurt over what has happened he just wants something that feels good in that moment and just ripping each other's clothes off like in my head I'm like they're just gonna rip each other's clothes off and make a baby of their own <laughs> seems <laughs> like the, where it was headed, but it was very hot to me. I, I thought that they, I just think they have so much physical chemistry, Adam and Sharon, but it was very unfortunately 
interrupted by Buzzkill Nick. He's calling Sharon's cell phone because Sharon has forgotten to pick up Faith from, I guess, school or a play date or something. But Nick's been calling her. She looks at her phone. She has like three missed messages from Nick and she realizes, oh crap, I, for I was so caught up in Adam's love drama and potentially getting some for myself that I forgot about my child <laughs> at school. <laughs> I felt a little bit bad for her. I think she had good intentions, but she just got a little bit sidetracked with the sex. So Sharon has to leave because she knows Nick is not going to be very happy with her. And Nick has a right to be upset. He comes over to her house when she gets home and he starts interrogating her, asking where she's been. And she says, again, she said this before, it's not your concern where I am, who I'm with. But Nick guesses right away that she was with Adam. It's just process of elimination for him. There's only one thing that would really tear her attention away from her daughter in that way. And so Nick is upset with her and she says, you need to think about your own life, Nick. You've got enough going on. Faith tells me she doesn't really like Avery and I get the impression that your relationship is being rushed and I think you need to step back and take a look at your own life before you come casting stones at me. So that was a very tense conversation between those two. Adam, as soon as he gets a moment alone, he decides to go to see Chelsea at her office where she's alone and he gives her this gift. It was supposed to be a gift to his child. It was it was a gift that he bought before she lost their baby and he had been holding on to it and he gives it to her and um, leaves and she opens it after he left and there was a blanket inside and she's reading this letter and Adam's like voicing it over the scene and just talking about his life growing up and how he's looking forward to all of the things he's going to do with his child and um, how this blanket was a blanket like what he had in Kansas and I guess he probably bought it in Kansas when they got married there or one of the trips he made there and and it was duly heartbreaking because you could feel that Chelsea felt so terrible he's writing a letter to his to his child that he really doesn't even know exists he now has another child that he doesn't even know about and so it was it was really really uh, heartbreaking and I guess my thought too during that scene was uh, Adam had no other reason to give her that gift than to twist the knife that's all that's that was exactly what that was intended to do because if it's not his child why would he give this gift to her he should have just got rid of it chalked it up to his losses and just moved on he specifically wanted to hurt her like maybe you're pregnant and having this child with this strange guy but you loved me we had a marriage we had a connection and I want to not let you forget that. I mean, I think he really wanted to stick it to her emotionally like she was sticking it to him by having this baby. So again, it was just this situation where they both are trying to one-up each other as far as hurting each other. And I, I'm trying so hard to see both sides of the coin, but there's also this part of me that feels like Chelsea did not have to lie. I don't think she had to go this route that she's going. She could have had exactly what she wanted. We all know that she loves Adam. She wants to be with Adam. She wants to have Adam's baby. That's exactly what she wants. She wants to get back together with him and she could have had that. I don't think that, I think her fears about Adam trying to take the child away are irrational. Yeah, Adam is a jerk. He's being a very big jerk right now. And in some ways, it's a little bit of a bait and switch because when they got together, Adam was putting on this front of being a changed man and he's just a pussycat now and so was she and they were this was the best of them their best sides their best foot forward in a way and now it's switched to he's reverting kind of back to the way his father is and I don't know it's just 
I, I understand why she doesn't feel connected to him right now, but I don't think he would ever take the child away. And I don't know if she loves him. It, it's weird. Like the problem in their marriage was first Sharon, but then later it became Victor. And I don't think that either of those things, especially the Victor thing, couldn't be overcome if she really, really wanted to. I don't know. I just think you could have told him that he's going to be the father. You didn't even have to get back together with him if you didn't want to, but you at least could have told the truth. You didn't have to create this complicated web of lies. It, I just have no sympathy for her at this point, and I wish I did, but I just don't. <laughs> so, Sharon shows back up at Adam's house after this uh, conversation with controlling Nick. And they just, Sharon and Adam just leave off. They start back up exactly where they left off again. It was like the second they saw each other, they were just ripping each other's clothes off. I think in Adam's mind, again, it's him wanting to forget, wanting to feel good. And I think Sharon is a little bit of a rebel. Yes, she wants him. I mean, she sexually is attracted to Adam. But at the same time, she doesn't like people telling her no. She's just come from a conversation with Nick where he's telling her, Adam's no good for you. You can't be getting involved with him. And that just makes her want it more. So they just start ripping each other's clothes off and making mad, crazy love, just passionate, uh-uh, bump and grind love. <laughs> Sharon have been waiting a while. It's been a while since they've made love. There's been so much sexual tension between them for months and months and then I felt like the love scene was over a little bit too quick. <laughs> I wanted that to last way longer. <laughs> but it was satisfying for what it was. Uh, let's see. So Adam has to go back to work at some point. He's still the CEO of Newman Enterprises and he's dealing with the, the repercussions of letting Victor into the company and also trying to let Victor into his life. He goes, Adam goes back to the office where Victor is sitting in the chair, <laughs> staking his claim, uh, just enjoying the view, I think, from his office again and feeling a sense of accomplishment. And Adam confides in Victor, of all people, about what's going on with Chelsea and the fact that she's pregnant with someone else's baby and and it's it's odd. I mean, they really have had not a, any type of personal relationship at all over the years and now here Victor is trying to give him advice and Adam's clearly hurt about the whole thing. Victor gives him a little bit of leeway, like, go ahead, go, you know, you don't have to be here. And it, it fits into Victor's M.O. perfectly. Like, he gets to pretend kind of to be the sympathetic ear. And I don't know, I just feel like it's at least a little bit manipulative of Victor. I think there's at least a sliver of he just wants his company back. He just wants to be in control of his company again. He wants to beat Adam. He wants to win out in this rivalry. He's trying to be a dad, be a friend, and all that stuff, but he also just really wants to win. And so he gives Adam a little bit of slack. Just, you know, you don't have to be here. It's fine. I'm holding down the fort. And as soon as Adam leaves, Victoria comes in the office and Victor tells her everything that's going on with Adam. Did you guys think that was weird? I, I mean, if I told someone, poured my guts out about everything that's going wrong in my life, I, I would expect them to keep some privacy. I mean, Victoria was, of course, being snippy, saying like, oh, well, Adam's not here, he's a CEO and he's not here, how come I'm here? You know, look at me, Daddy, I'm so much better than him, <laughs> was her perspective, certainly. And uh, Victor, I think, probably told her to get her to shut up, you know, like he's got his problems, but he didn't have to give her specifics, and I thought that that was odd. <sighs> Victor's just getting exactly what he wants as he usually does. He's got well, his kids working at the company and he's, it's odd, he seems to be very discouraging of Victoria working there at all, but 
telling her not to work there only works against him. Like, she's gonna do what she wants to do, and telling her she can't do it only makes her want it more, and he knows that. He's, he's saying, no, you don't have to be here, and that just makes her want to prove herself. She's playing right into his hand. It's just he's so able to manipulate, and he did get his, he's getting his wish. He's back in his office, back in his chair, and Adam comes back later, and they have a little bit of a conflict between, uh, like, who, uh, between them about who's going to get the main office. Like, they were throwing down over who gets Victor's office. <laughs> <laughs> they, Victor even offered to arm wrestle Adam for it. Whoa! Like, they're still competitive. And, and I do, I kind of like that dynamic of the relationship. I want to believe that there is caring there, but I also like that competitive edge. And ultimately, Adam buckles, <laughs> gives Victor his office, and uh, Victor, in return, tosses Adam the keys to the condo as promised, tells Adam to get out of that musty old mansion, couldn't agree more, move into the condo, his new digs, no expense spared, um, and I, it, he, it was so, it was so nice to see Adam walk into the condo for the first time, wasn't it? It's so much cleaner, nicer, modern, so much more his style, and Adam had no problem whatsoever christening the place with Sharon. <laughs> Sharon shows up and they decide to give it a go. I mean, some people maybe like open a bottle of champagne to celebrate, moving in. Adam just, just totally rocks on down to Sharon. Like he just, bam, like they just do it. It was so, again, awesome. I can't help it. I just feel the sexual chemistry. I know logically that Adam and Sharon are not probably good for each other, but they just have that pull that I love to watch. And after they did the deed, Sharon um, catches Adam on the phone. Like, she comes, he's downstairs in the main room. She comes down in one of his shirts, like she's wearing the dress shirt that he had on, which I think is so sexy. And she overhears him talking to Gloria on the phone. By the way, where's Gloria? <laughs> totally gone off the scene. But he tells Gloria that he's ready to sell the mansion and everything in it. Just, he wants to get rid of it. And I really think Sharon realized what, fully what was going on in that moment. Adam is trying to slash and burn. He wants to get rid of everything that had to do with Chelsea and the baby, and he wants to forget about it all. He wants to start over fresh, and that includes kind of trying to replace Chelsea with Sharon, which is odd. It's so weird how his affection has gone back and forth because in the in, way back when he started his relationship with Chelsea, he was almost trying to replace uh, Sharon with Chelsea, and now he's kind of trying to replace Chelsea with Sharon. So he really kind of bounces back and forth. Uh, so that, I think, burst the little bubble of their sex relationship. And Adam after this, goes back to find Chelsea once more. She was at the coffee house, and he gives her divorce papers. I don't know why he didn't do that before. Why did they not have divorce papers before? Were they both kind of holding off on it? I mean, if he was able to you know, snap, make them appear out of nowhere, why didn't he do it weeks ago? I think he was still holding on, she was still holding on, but he gives her the divorce papers, and, you know, t t tells her it's over and have a nice life, and I think what hurt more, I think the real real poignant part of the conversation was Adam gave her the divorce papers and also started accusing her of being a con artist, saying, you're a con, Chelsea. You were when I met you and you are now. And it's true. It's true. I know that that hurt her, but she's... It's, she, they are both what they always were. They got into this little bubble where they were pretending to be good people, and it, it didn't last. Now Adam's reverted back to being Victor Jr., and Chelsea's reverted back to being a con. She's still working con with uh, Dylan. So I can completely see, even though Adam doesn't know that, I can completely see why he would think that. Because they were together, they were happy, they lost the baby, and then when the Sharon thing started coming up, and the Victor thing started coming up, she, she you know, she pulled away too. It wasn't just him, she pulled away too. And she started, like, doing, you know, having all of this pregnancy stuff, and all of this stuff happened after 
the uh, she got the money from the divorce. Like he gave her half of what he had, which is another reason why I think she didn't have as much to fear from him. I think she's always been afraid of Adam having so much more money than her, but she took half of his money. So she's got money too. She can, she could, if Adam tried to take the child away from her, she could have fought him in court too. She's not some helpless little kitten. And she, she had just as many resources as he did. So I don't know. I can see why he almost wondered if he was being conned from the very beginning. She did get a lot of money out of him at the end of the day. So, Adam is disillusioned, I think, after giving her the divorce papers and realizing that maybe he, and feeling used, I think he becomes um, just really disheartened, disenchanted, and he just turns himself off, just shuts it down. What's the point of loving if you're just going to get hurt every time you do? He's opened himself up to a couple of times and it's just never worked out for him. So he goes back home and Sharon shows up and he's very coarse with her. It, in a matter of a day, the relationship with Sharon has gone from tender and supportive and yeah, hot and sexual to just functional functional and that's all like she comes back and they start talking about their relationship and Adam says this is not a romantic relationship even though they've talked about it for, for before even just within the last couple of weeks they kind of have admitted that they care about each other and so now all of a sudden he pulls back and he says this is just a purely sexual relationship there's nothing else between us he kind of makes it dirty and Sharon was like I think shocked and I think next week she's gonna tell him well fine if you're gonna act like this then I'm not gonna have anything with you it's not gonna be a sexual relationship either so bug off my concern is <laughs> I don't know if this is even possible but what if Sharon ends up pregnant too Chelsea obviously didn't know Dylan very well if she thought that he was just going to step away from his child it, it, like he was just going to be an easy mark and run away from the responsibility. That's not who he is at all from everything we know about him. And I am wondering what Chelsea's feeling about Dylan right now. Does she want him in her life? Or is she resentful that she has to deal with him now? Because he's not really the father and he's trying to get to know her. He's trying to make it right. He wants to know who she is. He wants to ask questions about the baby. He wants to be there for her in every way and possibly even try to have a relationship. So I wonder if that's going to get old for her. I wonder if if she doesn't resent it now, I wonder if she will soon because now she's going to be stuck with him. She's not in love with him and he's not really the father of the baby. So when is she going to get tired of this? She's having to scramble. I mean, once you tell the lie, you got to stick with the lie. She's m having to make up what the due date is and like calculate it backwards so that, you know, he doesn't figure out that she's farther along than, she, th than when they had sex. And she's just lying about morning sickness. Oh, I'm done with that. You know, just it's, she's, uh, it's not adding up. And so she knows she has to make up a lie in order to compensate for that. And Dylan, ugh, he's such a good guy, and he just takes her at face value. He doesn't really ask any questions, and uh, watching him get duped like this, like this, just makes me feel like Chelsea should be so ashamed of herself, and I think she is. She, she certainly should be. So Anita shows up back on the scene. I cannot stand Anita. I cannot stand this woman. <laughs> she walks in and she almost blows the whole thing wide open because she knows that it's Adam's baby and she starts to ask questions and Chelsea has to scramble around, oh no, this is Dylan, the father of the baby. And even though Anita had no idea what was going on with Chelsea and Dylan had never probably heard of Dylan before in her life. She jumps on board with the con right away. This is the kind of relationship that they have. They just assume that the other one is pulling a con or they, maybe they have a tell between each other. I don't know, but Anita just accepts right away. Okay, I'm going to go along with this. And she starts pressuring Dylan saying about how 
Chelsea is accustomed to the finer things in life. Are you going to be able to give that to her? What do you do for a living? Oh, you're a carpenter, huh? So when are you guys going to get married? Just really putting on the pressure. And it made me sick a little bit. She, after Dylan leaves, like... Anita starts telling Chelsea this isn't gonna work there's no point in this you're not gonna get any money out of this guy so what's the point of this con you need to get out of it as soon as possible which is probably actually good advice <sighs> Anita's prodding ended up causing Dylan to uh, leave and start thinking about his future and how he's going to provide for this child that isn't his. And so he goes to On the Boulevard and asks Billy for a job bartending. Hopefully he's still looking for a better job. He just seems like he should be doing more than bartending. And, uh, uh, good lord, Carmine ends up calling off for days on end. Tells Billy, uh, I can't be in, can't come in for a couple of days, I'm sick. This guy is such a creep. So Billy's like, all right, I'm kind of in a bind. You're hired. So now Dylan is behind the bar slinging drinks when Adam shows up to drown his sorrows, maybe play some more cards, and of course, just as a little cherry on top, taunt Billy about the fact that he's gambling and his wife doesn't know about it. But there's an obvious tension between Adam and Dylan and... Dylan just says, I want to keep this job. I don't want to start a fight. And Adam seemed a little bit more calm about it, as if he didn't really want to put forth the effort anymore. He was just tired and over it. So the one thing that was interesting was, obviously, Adam has it on his mind that Chelsea's a con artist. And he tells Dylan that. Like, you know, you may see her as this sweet, struggling artist, designer person, but she's a con artist. And that made me think that maybe Dylan would start to question her. If somebody told you that, that, like, you were involved having a child with someone who used to be a con artist, wouldn't that click for you, make you question? Like... I don't know why he, like, instead, instead of questioning, he goes to find Chelsea and he shows up with a single rose. He's trying to be romantic with her. He kind of wants to date her. And I thought, well, gosh, why, why don't you question her <laughs> or something? Why, why do you just accept it? And the only thing I can think is that maybe he wants it. He's lost a child with Avery. He feels lonely having lost Avery. He doesn't know where to go with his life. And here's a solution. Here's something that he can see as a goal. And maybe, maybe he wants it. Maybe this is the answer to something, a prayer for him. I don't know. I just think that Dylan is too good, too nice, too sweet for what's happening to him now. I personally wish Chelsea would just take her mother's advice. I wish, Ch I, I'm sorry you guys, but I wish Chelsea would leave town and not come back. <laughs> I just don't, I've never connected with her. It's, I've tried over, since she came onto the show, I've tried and I just, I have no connection with her whatsoever. Um, I think I just would like for her to leave town, let the kid come back maybe in 10 years as an adult and want to get to know Adam kind of in a very similar parallel to what happened with uh, with Adam in his childhood. I mean, yes, I want to, to Adam to know his son, but I just, I'm tired of the lies. I don't want him to be connected to Chelsea. I don't want to deal with Chelsea anymore. So let's just send her away. <laughs> I feel terrible. I mean, the thing is, if the writers are trying to make us like Chelsea, they're doing a really poor job of it. I don't see how anyone could like her right now. Avery notices that Dylan is still hanging around town and she questions him, says, why are you still here? There's nothing for you here. And Dylan has no choice but to tell Avery it's for his child that he got Chelsea pregnant. And it rocked Avery's world, as if the heartbreak with Dylan couldn't have been bad, and uh, badder, worse. <laughs> this was it. It, it. I think Dylan telling Avery 
uh, that he's got a woman pregnant has made her think about the child that they lost. And she has this flashback of the day that they were laying in bed together and she tells him that she's pregnant. And uh, it w was really tender. I really like Avery and Dylan together. I think that's the couple to be. I, I think Avery is still in love with him. I think she wishes that it were less complicated and now it's only more complicated. I I think she's very withholding. I think it's curious that she has not told Nick that she and Dylan ha had a baby together. I, and it's got to be because she doesn't want to lose Nick. If she tells Nick they had a child together, Nick is just going to realize how deep their connection is and he's going to give up, realize that he really can't compete with the past. But she obviously is is keeping secret. She's she's keeping uh, her, her emotions close to her vest, and she doesn't really want to acknowledge it. Um, and it's just making the situation worse. Nick walks in and sees Dylan and Avery talking together again, and it triggers his jealousy. And he tells her, "I can't keep doing this. I, I, you need to figure it out. Who do you want to be with?" And it's Nick and Avery's relationship is on really shaky ground. And to pile on, it doesn't seem like there's much support <laughs> from anybody for their relationship. Nick and Avery seem to be the only ones that are excited about their engagement. Victoria's reaction was kind of underwhelmed when she found out. Um, Sharon, every, everybody, everybody kind of realizes that they're rushing it. And to pile on, Faith doesn't like Avery. She doesn't want Avery around. She doesn't want to eat a muffin if Avery has been connected to it at all. I feel bad for the little girl. Uh, Nick and uh, Sharon sit down with Faith and try to talk to her about it. It's hard to make a, a child understand why things are changing in her world. Uh, Faith opened up and said that she's afraid that if Nick and Avery get married that Sharon and Nick won't be a family anymore, that those three won't be a family anymore. And Nick tried to, you know, explain it to her. I mean, I it's odd that, that, Avery, or that Faith, you know, seemed to adapt to Phyllis, but not this. It's like, she, whatever it is, she was used to the situation as is, and now it's changing and I don't blame her. I'm 33 and I would throw a fit if either one of my parents remarried. I know that's horrible, but like you want your parents to be together. That's kind of natural, or I think, if uh, most people I would say, I think that's natural for a child anyway. So they try to talk Faith down and have her feel better and Sharon did a good job of supporting it because even though Sharon doesn't necessarily agree with Nick's choices in his life, she realizes that it's his life and she doesn't have a place to tell him what to do. It would be nice if Nick returned the favor. <sighs> Avery does not know what to do. I think she knows that Nick is the safe bet in her life, she actually goes to Sharon to get a little advice on what she should do. And I was surprised, you know, I think Avery just needed someone who knows Nick, almost looking for a way to make Nick understand. And Sharon was very open with her. She said, you know, Nick is in love with being in love. That's kind of the guy he is, and maybe in some ways it's his fatal flaw. But if you don't love him 100%, if you love Dylan even 1%, then save us all a lot of trouble and don't go through with this marriage. And I kind of thought maybe Sharon talked Avery out of it, made Avery change her mind about Nick, but that wasn't the case. Avery goes to Nick's house and she's determined to make him see that she loves him and only him. So she decides to create this little romantic scenario. She's poured a couple of wines, she's turned on some music, um, and Nick walks in and she tries to romance him, but he's, he's not having it. You know, he's hesitant. He says it's, you know, we gotta put these loving feelings aside for a second and really talk about the reality. Why do you love me? Tell me the reasons why you love me. And she starts listing all of his great qualities and then he says, all right, now tell me why you love Dylan. And it makes her so very uncomfortable, but I can understand it. Nick just wants the truth. He just wants to know what he's getting himself into, and I think it's very fair. I mean, Nick said, 
<laughs> he actually said, I'm not a jealous guy, but <laughs> first of all, stop right there. Like, whatever. <laughs> you're a jealous, you're as jealous as they come. It's hilarious to hear you say, I'm not a jealous guy. You're obviously not in touch at all with who you are. Maybe you should also say, I'm not a controlling guy while you're piling on the false, uh, <laughs> the false statements about yourself. Ridiculous. He says, I'm not a jealous guy, but Dylan's always around and I have a right to know if this is what the rest of my marriage, the rest of my life is going to be like. <sighs> I think that Nick and Avery have been in hardcore denial up until now, up until this point. And now they're taking a serious look at the relationship and Nick is thinking about calling off the engagement. I mean, it's gotten to that point. I personally think that both of their instincts are telling them not to go through with it and they should probably trust that. Avery probably wishes that all of this drama with Nick would have happened before she had to go and tell Phyllis that they were engaged. That would have saved her a whole lot of trouble because Phyllis did not take it well. <laughs> I think that Avery was trying to do the right thing under the circumstances, telling her sister herself, not letting Nick do it. Nick would have done it, but she didn't want Phyllis to hear it from anybody but her. And that's, you know, that's somewhat honorable, I guess, in the realm of if you're gonna sleep with your sister's husband anyway and marry him right after they got divorced, I guess the least you could do would be to go tell her. But Phyllis did not appreciate it on any level. Phyllis actually, as soon as Avery told her they're engaged, Phyllis at first didn't believe it. And then as soon as she saw Avery wearing the ring, she just immediately got into child, this childish mentality. And she got up in Avery's face and started going, boy yo yo yoing, boy yo yo yoing. Do you hear that? That's the sound of Nick rebounding onto you. <sighs> what do you guys think about that? I'm telling you, I was strangled, Phyllis, getting up in my face with that childish crap. I mean, it made good TV, but I was like, somebody gets up in my face with that. Taking it to that level, we're adults here. If you want to have a conversation about it, that's fine. But don't do this boy yo yo <laughs> thing with me. I think Avery did a really good job of keeping herself composed in the moment, but I think Phyllis got inside of her head. I think it made Avery also doubt Nick's intentions. There's so much doubt on both sides in that relationship that it's not, it's not a good foot to start off on. And Phyllis knew that. Phyllis accused Avery again of taking everything that she had, taking her husband, taking her daughter. Sorry, Phyllis, you did that. You did that all on your own. You made this bed all on your own. I don't necessarily think it's right that Avery capitalized on it, but let's not point fingers at anywhere but yourself. You did that. But I thought it was really haunting the way Phyllis said to her, you know, you never had anything to lose. And it's very true, but it's the truth is changing because, well, now she does. Now that Phyllis is back from her vacation with Jack, she's decided to, she's gonna move in with them. She's not changing her mind on that. And now she has to tell Summer. So there's this scene with Phyllis and Summer at the condo and Summer's happy to hear that Phyllis is going to be moving in with Jack. At first she thinks it means that she's going to be living in the condo alone. Um, no, not quite. <laughs> but then it starts to dawn on her, oh wait, mom's living where my huge crush lives. So right away she realizes that she's going to be able to be able to spend more time with Kyle since her mom is going to be living there. So, oh, you guys, new Kyle. Let's talk about it. He had more scene, he had more lines that in his first appearance than the new Abby did. She had like two little mentions, two little words that came out of her mouth. New Kyle actually had some lines. My first impression, of course we can't like judge after having seen one scene with him, but this is what I think so far. I think the reason they recast the role was because they wanted to have somebody to pair with Summer. And that maybe this new Kyle is going to be a good chemistry match for Summer, that's certainly possible, but right off the bat, he sure does 
doesn't seem like Jack's son to me. It's just, it's just that they've always, Minar has always done a really good job of casting Kyle so far. All of the people they've cast really seemed like Jack's son, but there was a brief scene between new Kyle and Jack, and I don't know. I didn't, I didn't feel, I just thought, it's not really any kind of, I don't know, resent, like a mannerism resemblance. It's like new Kyle just kind of, he's in his own little world. I mean, we need to see more, but it was almost like Jack just sort of ignored Kyle in those scenes. Just like, oh yeah, he's my son, whatever, going about my business. I don't know, I think that, yes, it's, we're, you know, we're going to end up seeing romantic scenes between Kyle and Summer, but we also need to work on building up that father-son relationship between he and Jack. So I'm keeping my eye out for that. We'll have to see. Now, when Phyllis told Summer, uh, you're not going to be staying at the penthouse on your own, um, the weird thing happened. Um, I just thought it was like, where did you think that your daughter was going to go? Because she was like, oh, no, you're not staying here. And Summer was like, oh, well, maybe I'll go to, I'll live with you then. Um, I, we live together. I would assume I would follow you wherever you go. And Phyllis was very shocked to think that Summer wanted to live with the Abbott mansion. Like, it had never occurred to her before. Like, what was Phyllis planning to do with Summer? Was she just planning, like, Summer go live with Nick? Or uh, You must have had some sort of plan for your child. I know Summer's 18, but I don't know if that was odd. Summer, though, works her manipulation just right, no problems right uh, at all. Summer realizes this is an opportunity for her to spend more time with Kyle, and she, she just turns it on right away. She says that she wants to live with her mom because she doesn't want to live with Nick because of Avery. She doesn't want to live with Avery. She's always there and it's just, you know, she, she was playing Phyllis like a fiddle. Just saying exact. she knew exactly what Phyllis's sore spot was, Avery and Nick's relationship, and she exploited it to get what she wanted. Oh, I don't like Avery, so can I stay with you, Mom? Pfft. Summer learned to manipulate from the best. <laughs> she is indeed Phyllis's daughter. So now Summer's moving in, <laughs> and Kyle has got to be annoyed about this, don't you think? Is he annoyed like this girl will not leave me alone? They had a run-in at the restaurant, and she tried to say, oh, are you here with your girlfriend? And he's like, uh, no, but I plan on spending more time with her. I mean, I, I guess he was kind of meaning Phyllis. I think there's a little bit of an implication that Kyle still is carrying the torch for Phyllis. Oh, that's going to really tick Summer off. <laughs> if Phyllis is the woman that Kyle has his eye on, that's going to be, I mean, I don't know. Actually, now that I think about it, new Kyle and Phyllis, maybe that's where the chemistry test was supposed to be. Maybe that's, oh, that's going to tick Jack off. But it's going to be so appropriate. Like when uh, John and Jill, when Jack's father was married to Jill, Jack had an affair with Jill. So I always wonder if they're taking it back to history and we'll have Phyllis have an affair with Kyle. Ooh, that could be really bad. That would, that would be really bad. I really hadn't thought about that <laughs> until now. But so do you guys think that's it? I mean, do you think, what do you think Kyle feels about Summer? Is he annoyed by her or is he tempted? By her. You'll have to let me know what you think about that because Summer's trying to dress all sophisticated now. She wants to be seen as an older woman and Phyllis noticed right away that her daughter was dressing different and again, Summer's so manipulative. She says, oh, I just wanted to learn to dress more like you, Mom. You're so sexy and sophisticated at the same time. Right. You knew exactly. You're, we know. We all know what you're doing and it's got nothing to do with Phyllis. <laughs> But Summer's trying. She's trying hard to make her own way. Um, th there was a very awkward scene uh, with Phil or with um, Summer going to the uh, old Restless Style building where Chelsea works. Like Chelsea and Chloe are trying to hire models for their new line, and Summer was sent over there just as an intern. And right away, Tyler's like, "Oh, she's great. Why don't we put her on camera? Let's do a screen test. See if she could be one of our models." And Summer tries to back out of it really quick. She doesn't want to be anywhere near Chelsea. She still feels guilty. She's the reason that Chelsea lost the baby. If Chelsea had not lost Adam's baby, none of this other stuff would have happened. And so she tried to get out before Chelsea arrived, but Chelsea got there. There was a really a huge weirdness between them. And Summer was trying to bolt out the door when Chelsea caught her and actually just said, you know what? 
I'm getting a second chance, and so I want to give you a second chance, too. So it was, was kind of nice of Chelsea. It's like amongst all of the sea of lies and crap that she's pulled, she at least did one good deed, I guess. On the boulevard turned out to be a money pit for Billy. I knew it. I just had a feeling. Why would this guy want to get rid of a restaurant if it's successful? All of a sudden, as soon as Billy takes ownership, things are breaking. He can't, the ice machine's not working or there's problems with shipments. The place is falling apart and Carmine is perfectly happy to sit back and watch it fall apart. And to boot... Carmine is there tempting Billy to just go ahead and open up a gambling, a poker game, a regular poker game at the restaurant to try to make money to fix it. And Billy is struggling. He's a recovering gambling addict. And Carmine doesn't mind. He's just right there prodding and prodding along. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Billy's tempted and he's going to give in to that temptation. We're going to see more gambling at On the Boulevard. <sighs> Carmine is basically there on the scene to destroy lives. Like, you like your life? Here's Carmine to screw it up for you. <sighs> Michael is moving out. I'm very sorry to say. He's leaving Lauren. I mean, he packed up his things and left his keys. I, I, Lauren didn't want it. Did not want it. I think Lauren wants to fix things as as much as she's capable. I think she wants to fix things. But Michael made a really good point. Like, you know, if you still don't want me to leave, that just makes me feel like I should leave. Because why kill the love that we still have by continuing on this road and continuing to live together and, and uh, destroy things? I mean, let's leave it while there's still a little bit of love. Ugh! Oh, that just breaks my heart. I'm almost kind of surprised that he hasn't served her with divorce papers yet, considering his lawyer mind. I don't even know what's what's next for Michael. He's not working now. He's just a shell of a broken man, and I'm afraid to know what this is going to do to him. At this point, I almost kind of wish he would divorce her, because he, he just doesn't deserve this. He doesn't deserve what's happening to him. She lied to him and that's one thing the thing that really gets me is that she got him to believe that he's the bad guy that it's his fault that the marriage fell apart and that's just simply not true she plaques along the blame that's what really kills me <sighs> it's really sad to watch their relationship fall apart um fen is back and he's suddenly realizing that he has feelings for Summer. After everything that they've gone through, she's told him kind of many times that she's not interested in him. He professes his feelings to her, and she rejects him. And all of this happens at On the Boulevard, where Carmine is lurking over the scene. And ugh, Carmine actually walks up to Finn after he sees him get shut down. And he gives him some chilling advice. He basically says, oh, well, if you want her, what you need to do is go after her with everything that you've got. And later we see Fen's face like he's creeping outside of the Abbott Mansion where Summer's moving in to be, be closer to Kyle. And he realizes that Kyle's who Summer is interested in and he's got this creepy look on his face. Fen, don't take a page from the Book of Carmine. That's the worst thing that you can do. Ugh. Later, too... Carmine is, oh, this really, really pissed me off. He's at the bar talking with Billy, and he's trying to encourage him to open up this gambling house, and Lauren walks in. And he says to Billy, I cannot even believe this. This is the line. This is the telling line. He says to Billy, you know, you should go ahead and, like, open, and open the poker game. Sometimes cheap tricks pay high dividends. He says this right after looking at Lauren. And then he walks over and he pours her a glass of wine and he's all charming and he's got her laughing. Oh, I am furious. I know that he's become stalkery in the last couple of weeks, but there was a hint at the very beginning of maybe he really likes her. I don't know. But based on that comment alone, sometimes cheap tricks pay high dividends. 
that makes me think he never cared for her. Like, I wonder if his endgame in all of this may just have been sex and blackmail. This week, Kevin comes crawling back to Chloe after saying her that their relationship wasn't much last week. Like, he was last week acting as if their relationship was not interesting. And this week, he's crawling back saying, oh, I didn't really mean it. And he tries to be all sweet and sensitive. And Chloe wanted to believe him, but then she just said no. You know, we're, we are in a rut, and the magic is gone. I'm glad. I'm glad because I just have not felt the magic for those two for a really long time, and I think this is a really good sign. I, I'm sorry, but I think that both of the characters were more interesting when they were on their own or with other people. I think there's a lot of things that could potentially happen by just busting up that uninteresting couple. Although, I don't know, if you're a Chloe and Kevin fan, uh, you should definitely leave me a comment and, and let me know why you like them. So, Catherine's having brain surgery this week. Maybe Chloe and Kevin would like to loot the house while she's away. <sighs> it's so hard to watch Catherine hurting like this and going through what she's going through alone. Mm. She's in the waiting room, or in the like the hospital prep room, uh, preparing for her brain surgery. She's with Kane. Kane's the only one that she's opened up to. And then, out of nowhere, like a ray of sunshining light, Murphy, Angel, walk through, walks through the door. <laughs> he finally shows up for Catherine to be there for, for to be there for her. Finally, Murphy's triumphant return. He had like three lines. <laughs> But it's, I was so glad to see him. I think it's totally ridiculous to think that Catherine would have brain surgery without telling her husband. What if something happened to her? She could have died. <sighs> I mean, I'm sure she won't. I'm sure she'll make it out just fine. I don't know what, I don't even know what the ultimate goal of this whole thing is. I guess she'll have, she'll have brain surgery and be fine. I'm not sure. But she is very much leaning on Kane right now. She actually asked him to take over at Chancellor Industries, so ooh, that's not very good because it means he's going to probably do that and it's going to leave Lily and Tyler alone and unmonitored. <laughs> but I think he agrees to do it, and like I can really appreciate Kane for being there for her, but I think it's taking him away from other things that need his attention, and... I don't like that Catherine is choosing not to confide in her very close immediate family members. Jill didn't know. I can see. I can see Jill, uh, Catherine not telling Jill because Jill is overprotective and I can understand him. I mean, Jill deserves to know, but I, th I can kind of understand why Catherine wouldn't want to deal with Jill's yakking on top of it all. But she didn't tell her own husband. She didn't tell Nikki at all. Jill saw Nikki at the hospital, assumed that, you know, Nikki knew everything and, and that was not the case at all. So nobody knows what's going on with her. She's keeping it all to herself and I just keep thinking, what if something bad were to happen to her? How would, how would, she, her family deserves to know. How would they feel? It was, uh, it's hard to watch uh, Catherine being wheeled away into surgery and she just seemed so brave. She was saying, I love you, I love you all. She was being wheeled away with bare minimum makeup on. And it's very eerie to watch um, given the kind of recent health condition of Jean Cooper. Uh, she had been in t the uh, critical care, like the ICU, what, two weeks ago? I think she was in the hospital maybe for a few days to a week, and it was not looking good. I was almost getting the impression that, oh, this could be the end, and she made it out. She's at home now. I think she's resting and recovering, but, um, you know, it was a little bit eerie seeing Catherine go through a health storyline right at the same time when the actress is actually having health troubles, but let's all send, you know, good thoughts of recovery her way. I know I certainly have been keeping her in my thoughts. Gus had a heart attack and now he is in the hospital and 
uh, Leslie's really struggling with this. She just got her father back. She thought for forever that he was some horrible monster. Uh, he was in jail. She was instrumental in getting him released from jail. And now this. And I think she feels very guilty for the fact that they were having trouble getting along as roommates. And she's, you know, suspicious of him. She doesn't know what to think of him. And uh, one thing someone mentioned to me last week that I think is a really good point. Have you guys noticed that Neil is being very there for her, but in a way, it is it is kind of almost more like fatherly. I just get, you know, he's so, it, there's no, I don't feel romantic between them. I, I, don't, I don't know, like, it's just, I have to say, probably of all the storylines on the show, this is the one that I'm least interested in. It's so brought to the forefront. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just so in the forefront right now, and they're just B characters. To me, Leslie and Tyler are still very, they're just B characters, and it's not, I don't know, I don't feel like I know Leslie well enough to care that much about her relationship with her father. I mean, I get it, and it's not entirely unenjoyable, but it's definitely not one of my favorite storylines, and I don't feel passion between Leslie and Neil at all that's carrying me um, to want their relationship to keep going. But Gus wakes up from being unconscious from his heart attack, and uh, Leslie is there with him, and he says, Rose, out loud. This is what he says upon waking up. Rose. I'm surprised it wasn't Rosebud, but no, he says a woman's name. And she thinks it's very curious. She doesn't know of any Rose. And so she questions him about it when he wakes up and he denies it right away. He's just like, no, that wasn't, you know, you, you made the must have mistaken. I didn't say that. And it was very super suspicious the way he just denied it right away and didn't want to talk about it. And it essentially gives Leslie an excuse to pry. She wants to know who Rose is. Gus has that box, the secret box. Tell somebody not to touch what's in the box and all they're going to want to do is get inside that box. And that's what she did. She goes home, cracks open the box, and there's letters in it that are address from someone in Chicago. I, I don't know if it's an old flame or what, because she asks Gus again when she goes back to the hospital about who Rose was, and he only vaguely alludes to, you know, acknowledges that it was someone he knew. I think he said it was another mistake I made, you know, just some, or something else I messed up or something. And then bleeps start going off in the hospital room and he, they all got to be rushed out so that he can be fixed. <laughs> so it, the storyline just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And I don't care that much, to be honest with you. <sighs> I don't know, we'll see. I'm not sure if maybe uh, Leslie's mother is someone else. Is Rose really their mother? I don't know what the story is going to be. Leslie's ready to cry. Tyler is just ready to sex his problems away. Neil flat out questioned Lily about what's going on between her and Tyler. He senses that she's uncomfortable around him and that she's a little jealous. And he knows that Tyler's caused some tension between in her marriage. So he asks her about it and she admits that the flirting was nice. She likes flirting with him, but she insists that it, you know, it, it only made her appreciate her life more. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, Lily. I, I, I completely identify with her saying it was nice to, it's nice to actually be seen as something other than a wife and a mother, just seeing, you know, being seen as someone desirable, as if Kane doesn't do plenty of that. But I think she's obviously struggling with it more than, than she's letting on. She's very jealous of Tyler being around other women, and, and she, Tyler's going on dates, and he's struggling in his own way with what's going on with his father. He's not close to the man. He doesn't want him to die, but he doesn't know how to make a connection. He wants to be there for his sister, wants to do what's right, but he just can't connect. He's still so bitter about what's going on with his father, so he's trying to date. It's all of a sudden, Tyler's around all kinds of women. <laughs> They're at the bar. Noah's introducing him. He's going home with other women. That wasn't the woman he was with last week. Like He's obviously a play, you know, kind of being the playboy right now, and Lily does doesn't like it. She actually saw him leaving the office with a single rose, like he picked out of one of the floral arrangements in the office, and she sees him walking out with a single rose, getting ready to go on a date, and she obviously doesn't want him to go, but she can't ask him 
not to. She can't ask him to move on with her life. It, I feel, I just, I do understand a little bit where Lily is coming from. It's like, she's trying to throw herself into Kane's arms to, arms to maybe make these feelings that she doesn't want to have go away, but the feelings are there and she, they just, they can't just be turned off. Okay, everybody, that's this week in YNR. I'm curious to know how you guys feel about everything that's going on on the show. So go ahead, leave me a comment. There's a little comment box below this video and you're more than welcome to let it rip. You can leave one comment, 10 comments, get it all out, say what you gotta say. <laughs> I always look forward to hearing from you guys. It's such a pleasure. And I'll be back next week. <laughs> we'll see where we are next week at this time. It's very fun to be on this trip. <laughs> The show's good. I mean, there are definitely some things that I don't love, but there's a, there's plenty going on that I really do love. So I'll be back next week. We'll chat again about it. Okay, you guys. I love ya. I'll see you then. Bye.